It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, well, thanks uh, very much, Speaker. Before I start, though, I just want to um, say a, a big uh, thank you to first responders uh, in the Ottawa area um, who you know, made sure that people were safe and that uh, as the uh, storms were happening on Sunday, they uh, made sure that folks were safe and, and took care of uh, people's concerns. It's been a tough go in the Ottawa area, and uh, the, um, you know, the challenges on the weekend were yet another uh, difficulty that uh, first responders had to deal with, and, and the people of Ottawa Vanier as well. So I think our heart goes out to everyone, and, and thanks, thanks to everyone as well. Uh, speaker, my question is for the uh, Premier. Earlier this morning, I laid out details of legislation that would ensure municipalities don't have changes to their governance opposed on them, uh, imposed on them without their consulta consultation or their consent. Sadly, that hasn't been the reality in Ontario over the last year, as the Premier made clear when he cancelled elections in Peel and Toronto, even if it meant bypassing the Constitution and using the notwithstanding cla clause. So my question is, what guarantees do Ontarians have that the Premier won't be doing this again? The question is to the Premier. Minister of Municipal Affairs. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, our government values uh, our municipal partners, and uh, we have had and will continue to have a very robust consultation with uh, our stakeholders, including the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Looking forward to uh, our a monthly meeting uh, at the Umo MOU table uh, next week, and I look forward to continuing to meet with uh, our partners. Uh, the uh, the regional governments uh, have a meeting uh, next, uh, or sorry, they have a meeting this Friday. I look forward to uh, engaging with them. I just finished meeting with Lumco a couple of weeks ago, as most people in the House uh, realize. And and again, Speaker, our government is committed to consulting with our municipalities. We've proven. Uh, through the AMO MOU table that we're able to have a very robust discussion. Uh, we'll continue to do so, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, this year the Premier attempted to impose retroactive cuts to municipal services ranging from school breakfast programs to paramedics, um, which is actually why the Minister had to meet with Lumco so that he could backtrack on those uh, uh, odious decisions. This week he's ignoring municipal concerns about Bill 108, his scheme to let developers override municipal planning and environmental regulations. Letters rejecting Bill 108 continue to pour in from municipalities across the province. I can't imagine Lumco wouldn't have something to say about it. Will the government listen to Ontarians' municipalities this time and cancel the regressive changes proposed in Bill 108? Questions referred to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Speaker, I made, Speaker, I made it clear to uh, the Please. members of Lumco that uh, we would hope that uh, all 444 municipalities would look to uh, find efficiencies to help that level of government work more effectively and deliver services as best as they can to uh, their constituents. But, Speaker, I, I want to correct uh, the record in terms of our consultation. We, con we consulted widely on Bill 108 and our More Homes, More Choice, Ontario's Housing Supply Action Plan. We received over 2,000 submissions. 85 per cent of those submissions came from the general public. In terms of our regional government review, we received, I believe, in excess of 5,000 submissions from the public through our online portal. We continue to consult with municipalities, and we've indicated, Speaker, that uh, in terms of Bill 108 on the Community Benefits uh, Authority, we will continue to consult with municipalities. We will continue to sit across the table from them and get their advice on how to proceed in that section. Thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the government is once again running roughshod over Ontario's municipalities with Bill 108. They've had just one day of hearings and refuse to expand those hearings while municipalities continue to send in concerns by letter to this very day, Speaker. From Durham to Brampton to South Frontenac to Aurora, municipalities are passing resolutions, Speaker, asking the government not to move forward with legislation that will revert back to the old 
so-called OMB model. But the Premier, of course, isn't listening. He won't extend deadlines for comments. He won't offer any more time for committee hearings. He continues to stonewall Ontario municipalities at every turn and refuses to engage in a meaningful consultation. Why is the government once again shutting out Ontario's municipalities and not considering what they have to say? Minister. Again, Speaker. In, in terms of the community benefits charge, that's exactly what we've indicated. We've indicated <laughs> that we are going to be consulting municipalities on the formula that ultimately is presented. Again, Speaker, we've consulted uh, municipalities, we've consulted the general public, but Speaker, we have to realize why we tabled Bill 108. More homes, more choice. For too long, Speaker, government has stood in the way of creating affordable housing options for people in this province. We're in a housing crisis yes. in this province, and we have to do something. We can no longer have government standing in the way. We have to work with all of our partners, whether they be nonprofits, whether they be uh, the home builders in this province or our municipalities. But make no mistake, Speaker, we're going to continue to consult, but we need more housing and more choice now. We can't wait another minute. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, thanks very much. My next uh, question is also to the Premier, but I have to say there's a crisis in housing affordability, Speaker, and this government is not solving it with their ramming through of Bill 108. Tomorrow we'll have a long way to Government side, come to order. Speaker, to hear. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Government side, come to order. Thank you. Start the clock. Tomorrow we'll have a long-awaited opportunity to hear from Minister of, uh, the Minister of Health as the Standing Committee on Estimates gets a chance to review the Ford government's uh, scheme for health care spending cuts. But perhaps the Premier can get the ball rolling for us today, Speaker. The Financial Accountability Office tells us that, the Ontario, that Ontario's health budget will be decreased by $2.7 billion over the next two years. Can the Premier tell Ontarians how many more patients will be stacked up in hallways as a result? of these cuts to our health care system. The question is to the Premier. Minister of Health. Referred to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. As the Leader of the Official Opposition knows, we made a promise to the people of Ontario last year during the last election campaign that we were going to end hallway health care, we were going to increase the number of long-term care beds, we were going to make sure that we created patient-centred health care. And that's what we're, we're doing. We have actually added $1.3 billion to the health care budget for this year, and that's going to be expanded in a variety of ways, but we want to make sure that we're going to end hallway health care. That's one of our key promises. Right now, we have over 1,000 patients a day receiving home health care in hospital hallways, storage rooms, and other places that are not acceptable, not for patients and not for providers. We're going to end that. We are increasing spending because Response. we know that is an important policy, that is an important concept that the people of Ontario expect us to continue. Health care and education are those two key policies, and that's what we're going to deliver. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I might want to remind the government that their last election campaign, campaign claimed that they were going to make cuts, but they weren't going to touch health care or education. So much for that, Speaker. Right. So much for that. Because, in fact, the in Independent Order. Financial Accountability Office was crystal clear in their report. Again, Financial Accountability Office is independent. It's not government spin. It's a person and a group of people that work for the, for the public without any bias. Ford government is what they, what they said is proposing Order. to cut health spending to a level that Ontarian has only seen once in 40 years during the Mike Harris government of the 1990s. During that time, Ontario families saw 6,000 nurses fired and 28 hospitals closed. Has the Cut First Plan Later government prepared Order. any analysis whatsoever of how this round of cuts will impact frontline health services and staff? Stop the Government side, come to order. Start the clock. Minister to reply. Thank you. Well, I certainly want to be clear to the people of Ontario.
Ontario what's actually happening here. We are increasing health care spending by $1.3 billion as a result of this budget. And any uh, the financial accountability officer, I have no quarrel with the report that he's prepared. I would suggest, though, that some of the suggestions that uh, he has made with respect to cuts are actually accounting differences. What's happened is some of the some of Order. the funds that were accounted for that were appeared to come out of the come to order. cancer screening budget have actually been transferred to Cancer Care Ontario. Here, here. So there are there are differences in the accounting, but the actual overall amount is increased. One point three billion dollars more going into health care this year. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it seems to me when a government wants to refute an independent officer of the legislature, they rely on accounting differences, just like the previous government did. Now this government's playing the Order. same game. But the reality is there are $2.7 billion over two years being cut from our health care budget. That's what this government is doing. The Financial Accountability Office is clear. Order. The system of our health care system is facing reckless cuts, cuts to children's mental health, cuts to cancer screening, Speaker, cuts to hospital budgets. You can't claim to be ending the, health, health, the hallway health care crisis when you're following the lead of Mike Harris, Conservatives who created it, and the Liberals who made it worse, Speaker. When will this Premier come clean about what he's cutting? Minister. Well, again, let me be clear to the Leader of the Official Opposition. We are increasing health care spending by $1.3 billion. $1.3 billion an increase. The suggestion with respect to cancer screening, I've already explained, that has been transferred to Cancer Care Ontario. With respect to mental health and addictions, children's mental health and addictions, Order. again, that is money that was promised. $58 billion was, million was promised by the previous Liberal government. That was a fantasy budget, as we all know. There was no money there. There is money in this budget. We have spent $18 million of that. The rest of the $40 million was never, never actually used because it didn't exist. We are spending money that actually exists in increasing the health care budget by $1.3 billion this year. Member for Waterloo must come to order. A member for King Vaughan must come to order. All the members must come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier, but i got to say, nobody believes this government anymore. No, Talk about a fantasy budget. They had to roll back half their budget just a week ago, Speaker. Last Friday, Stats Canada revealed that for the first time in 40 years, the life expectancy of Canadians is declining, and the blame for that rests with the opioid crisis, Speaker. Can the Premier explain why, given the depth of this crisis, the government closed overdose prevention sites and is blocking efforts to establish them in communities? where they're desperately, desperately needed. Questions to the Premier. Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you. Thank you. This government... government does take the opioid crisis very seriously. That is why, when we did our review of the overdose treatment sites uh, last summer and into the fall, we took a look at what was actually happening in the centres, and that's why we repurposed them to become consumption and treatment sites, because, of course, it's important to save lives, to make sure that people that are overdosing receive the care that they need. That's important, but the other part of it is to help them get the treatment that they need. They're not, they were not getting the treatment that they needed in the previous centres. That's why we're repurposing them. We have opened 15 sites. There are six more yet to be opened. We are reviewing the applicants under very, very strict circumstances to make sure that they are going to be able to provide that assistance. But they can't Spons. do everything within the consumption and treatment services sites. That's why, as part of the $3.8 billion that we have promised that we will spend over the next 10 years on both uh, mental health and addiction services. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. 
Well, Speaker, well, the government talks about responding to this crisis, their actions on addictions and mental health speak louder than words. Closing overdose prevention sites, a $330 million cut to mental health funding, a $69 million cut to children's mental health. Over a thousand Ontarians died of an overdose last year alone, Speaker. Why is the government moving backwards as this crisis continues to grow and get worse? Minister. Thank you. Well, uh, Speaker, I think it's important to look at the facts of the situation. We have pledged and we are spending $1.3 billion more on health services this year in the province of Ontario, including $174 million more on mental health and addiction services. That is for this year, and that is annualized funding that's going to continue year after year after year. We are taking the opioids crisis very seriously. That is why we have set up 15 of the consumption and treatment services sites to help people with overdoses, but also help them when they are ready to go into therapy to get the services that they need. That is not all of the work we have to do. There's more that's going to come from that $174 million, more detox beds, more community and social services, getting people the help that they need in the community so that they don't need to be in crisis Response. to be in those situations, so they make sure Andrea, that they can order. get the help that they need to get the services that they need. We are going to make sure that we do that. We're reviewing more sites. I think it's important to note we have open CT. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. It has been almost a year now since the people of Ontario voted for change. Our government hit the ground running and hasn't stopped since. It will be a year this Friday. We can Order. now say more than ever to the people of Ontario, promises made, promises, promises kept. kept. We scrapped the cap and trade carbon tax, we're cutting red tape and creating good jobs, and we're putting money back in people's pockets through tax relief for families with children and for lower income workers in the province. Following the introduction of the Bringing Choice and Fairness to the People last, last week, could the Premier inform the House of what else our government is doing to fulfill the promises we made to the good people of Ontario? Questions to the Premier. Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I, I want to thank the member from Burlington for the question and all the great work she does in Burlington. There, there this weekend. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Speaker, we made a promise to the people of Ontario, and we plan on keeping our promises as we've had kept all our promises all the way since uh, last year. It's almost come up to be a, a year. We're going to put beer and wine in the corner stores and big box stores and more grocery stores. And I was thinking of our, our visitor from the United States. He's probably sitting up there thinking, you got to be kidding me. You don't have beer in a grocery store? You don't have wine? Well, I want, I want to say to our friend from the United States, we're the only jurisdiction in the entire world that had a sweetheart deal from the previous Liberal government, the Liberal lobbyists that made millions of dollars off the backs of the taxpayers, increased the cost of beer Response. at the beer store. And Mr. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to make sure people have the convenience when they hold a barbecue to be able to go into the store and actually buy a case of beer. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the Premier for his response. It is exciting to hear how our government is committed to expanding the sale of beer and wine. We all know that consumers, small businesses and local breweries all stand to benefit. The Retail Council of Canada says that expanding the market could create up to 9,000 new jobs wow. and add $3.5 billion to Ontario's GDP. It will introduce a much-needed competition that will help lead to lower costs for consumers. It will provide convenience to responsible adults and support growth in our small businesses from Burlington all the way to Belleville and beyond. Clearly, the status quo is unacceptable. Could the Premier explain why bringing fairness, fairness to the people is so important to us? Premier. Uh, thank, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the, the member for the question once again. 
You've heard our all-star minister of finance uh, say this, and I'll say it again. This isn't about just beer and wine. It's not just about choice and convenience. This is about fairness. It's about fairness to the people. It's about the fairness to the retail folks that are out there working all day, all night. Most people don't realize that the beer store isn't owned by the government. It's, by, it's owned by three global giants, three global giants that don't worry about the people in Ontario. They're worried about putting money in their pockets. That's what they're worried about. We're worried about the convenience. And isn't it amazing, Mr. Speaker, just imagine, just imagine, but we aren't going to do this. Just imagine if all the NDP Spons. writings opted out. Opted out. They'd be going crazy, their constituents, if they ever opted out. But we aren't going to do that because we're going to make sure we give your constituents a convenience. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members take their seats. Order. Order. The government side come to order. The opposition side come to order. Member for Essex come to order. The Premier come to order. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry come to order. The member for Essex come to order. Wow. Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek come to order. <laughs> Mr. Government Services come to order. Start the clock. The member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this question is for the Premier. Last week, Adrienne Roberts received a notice that her employment as a teacher at Grand Erie District School Board will be terminated on August 31st, another sad outcome of this government's cuts to education. After Adrienne posted her layoff notice on Twitter, the Premier's office tweeted back condolences. Then they blamed the school board for playing politics. Speaker, the Premier's cuts to education and, frankly, their scheme to jam up to 20, 40 kids in secondary classes means Adrian will be just one of thousands of teachers without a job by the end of this government's term. Let's be clear, she has no choice. There, are no, there is no fairness and there are no choices for these teachers. Is the Premier finally ready to admit that his cuts to classrooms will mean teachers lose their jobs? The question is to the Premier. Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And every day I'm pleased to stand up in this House and talk about how we are moving forward and making sure that our government continues to d display actions and guarantee to people across Ontario that the learning environments in the classroom is our number one priority. You know, let's take a look at some other information that we're hearing. 100% of the Toronto Catholic District School Board high school teachers will have a job in September. In Lambton, Kent, we heard uh, specifically 82 teachers with the Lambton, Kent District School Board who were rumored to be out of work by the next school year will be brought back in 2019. And we've also learned that other school boards that are choosing to fearmonger actually need to take a step back. We've asked Spons. school boards across this province to work with us, but unfortunately, we have just learned that the Toronto District School Board, instead of investing money in the classroom, they're investing money in their own administrative. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Remind the members when the speaker stands up, you have to sit down. Supplementary question. I should just start by saying that the minister is actually uh, needs to be corrected on that. 
on that item because, in fact, she's doing a great disturb disservice to the Toronto District School Board. She knows perfectly well that that did not happen and it is not happening. Speaker, first, the Premier Order. blamed parents for skewing the results of this million dollar education survey. I have to ask the member to withdraw. I have to ask the member to withdraw. Okay. On okay. On Speaker, Speaker, first, the Premier blamed parents for skewing the results of his million-dollar education survey. Then he blamed students who oppose his plans, calling them pawns. Then he blamed teachers and education workers, calling them union thugs. And now this government, Mr. Speaker, is desperate, desperate to pin the blame on school boards. Anything anything to avoid taking actual responsibility Question. for the deliberate chaos they are causing in our schools. Why won't the Premier just be straight with Ontarians and admit that this plan means fewer resources, fewer class options and fewer jobs for teachers? Thank you. Question to refer to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much. Do you know what I cannot believe, Mr. Speaker, is that we saw it firsthand right here in this House that the member opposite is choosing to support a school board that is not putting money into the classroom and supporting teachers on the front line. The fact wow. of the matter is she is absolutely order. spinning her wheels because the fact is the facts matter, and only when the Toronto District School Board got Opposition caught to order. last Thursday because media started inquiring did they choose to cancel the contract. Wow. Facts matter, and wow. you better stick with the facts because you're not getting anywhere else. And at least four Previous audits Response. and external reviews have identified procurement issues with the Toronto oh, District School Boards over the recent years. Oh. Speaker, yes, I absolutely appreciate all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My Ottawa community has been uh, affected, so thank you for the paramedics who had to be called this weekend. My question is for the Attorney General. I recognize that juridis jurisdictional disputes between the federal government and the provincial government should not be borne by children. The Jordan Principle, upheld by the courts, tells us that all First Nation children should have equal access to government services, and the first government who comes in contact with the child should respond for her needs. Children should not be denied while governments bicker about who should pay. This government has cancelled the Children in Transition benefit for children of refugees, and the Attorney General has said that she believes that it's the federal government that has the obligation to care for these children. The Convention Question. on the Rights of the Child says that any government must look after children on its territory, irrespective of the status of its parents. Is she holding children hostage in our ongoing battle with the federal government? I believe the question is addressed to the Attorney General. The Attorney General. Here, and I thank uh, the member opposite for the question. Our government is committed to helping the most vulnerable in our society, and we have continued to do that um, within my ministry. Uh, we've, uh, uh, with respect, I I'm not sure where the, the member opposite's question was going. It was a bit circuitous, uh, but I can tell you that with respect to funding for legal aid services, we are continuing to call on the federal government to meet its responsibilities. You know, Mr. Speaker, the previous government spent billions and billions of dollars on interest expense that it could have spent on helping our most vulnerable in our society, our children, our newcomers to Canada, and we are committed to getting it right. We are committed to ensuring that the supports that we do provide to the most vulnerable in our society are sustainable. We are taking the time to speak with them. We are taking the time to look closely at the books to make sure that we are providing the, the su necessary supports so that when they need them 10 years from now, we are still able to provide them instead of paying down even more money in interest expense, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. 
The, the Children in Transition program was a small program that the government's own numbers said 16 children a month were being helped by then, and they needed that to have access to food and clothing. So the, the Premier said uh, last Friday, free the beer as a, good, uh, as a good slogan, but I think feed the children is also a very good slogan. The need for this program is compounded by the cost to legal aid for refugees because it will take longer for families to act actually have access to their status. Does the minister not see that the cumulative effect of no representation and no assistance for these children will jeopardize their start in Ontario and their ability to later become productive members of our society? Does she not see that this will be a black mark on our reputation to wage a war with the federal government Question. on the backs of children? Will she commit today to tell her colleagues to reinstate the Children in Transition program? Thank you. Again, the Attorney General to reply. The Minister of Transportation. Referred to the Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again for that question. You know, our government for the people is moving forward with social assistance reforms that's going to restore dignity, encourage employment, and empower the provinces most vulnerable to get back to a path of, towards self-reliance, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are not going to be implementing the changes to the transitional child benefit to First Nations in Ontario Works. Um, we, we will not be implemented that way. But, however, Mr. Speaker, we are needing to make changes. The transitional child benefit provided roughly an average 16,000 recipients with a total expenditure of $67 million. Refugee claimants account for almost 50 per cent of the total uh, trial, transition child benefit expenditure, but only made up 35 per cent of the recipients, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we need to ensure that we're able to provide a program to the children of this province. Uh, in order for them to be supported wholly. And, Mr. Speaker, that's what we're doing. Uh, we are going to continue with the child, child benefit programs Response. to ensure that's equal access to get the government support that they need. And, Mr. Speaker, filing your taxes allows you to uh, access the child benefit report, by, and we'll be increasing the investment by 30. Thank you very much. The next question, a member for Peterborough Quartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Great Minister. Late last week, our government was made aware of a dire situation in northern Ontario. A wildfire began to spread near Pekanjikum, First Nation. On May 29th, at 1.30 a.m., the community declared a state of emergency because the flames and smoke were coming dangerously close to the community. Mm -hmm. Our government was ready to mobilize the necessary supports for Pekanjikum during this crisis. Quick and Quick action is incredibly important when a community is threatened by a wildfire. Can the minister please tell the members of this House about how our government came to the aid of the people of Pekanjikum, First Nation? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think the first thing that we should say is thank you. Thank you to the leadership in Pekanjikum. Uh, Chief Amanda Sanawap uh, and, uh, frankly, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, our pilots, workers on the ground with the Ministry of Transportation of Ontario at, uh, uh, at the uh, runway there, Mr. Speaker, kept it going. We're pleased to report that 1,600 uh, people have been evacuated through um, the Department of National Defense, Hercules planes and some of our own, as well as a couple of commercial operators who chipped in, Mr. Speaker, and those people are now out in host cities from Timmins, uh, Cochrane, Smooth Rock Falls, Mr. Speaker, Thunder Bay, Dryden, Sioux Lookout, and Winnipeg, Mr. Speaker, and coordinated efforts on the ground with uh, other officials from other ministries here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, are making sure that those people are getting the care and follow-up that they uh, deserve, Mr. Speaker. We're very pleased with the response. It was response. a bit frantic Thursday uh, after the initial pass from the Hercules, but things have gone smoothly since then, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister of Indigenous Affairs for that response. I'd also like to thank the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry for deploying the fire crews to keep this fire at bay. I'd like to thank the Minister of Indigenous Affairs for taking such a strong leadership role to coordinate municipalities that were able to house those who are being evacuated from Pekanjikum. During these challenging emergency situations, it's imperative that our government communicates effectively with partners and support providers that play important roles in emergency responses. In this case, it became clear that an evacuation was going to be necessary. Mm -hmm. Can the minister please tell the members of this House 
more about our role in helping vulnerable members of the community reach safety. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's true that an open line of communication was established uh, very quickly. Uh, I've had a couple of conversations with leadership on the ground and Grand Chief uh, Alvin Fiddler to make sure that uh, community members that were evacuated, Mr. Speaker, found a safe uh, place in various cities across northern Ontario, northwestern Ontario, and into Manitoba, Mr. Speaker, and that they were well uh, taken care of. We appreciate the Provincial Emergency Operations Centre. Some of my staff in particular, Mr. Speaker, in Indigenous Affairs Ontario, um, on Thursday afternoon, we assumed, Mr. Speaker, a, a coordinating role to ensure that all ministries across our government were involved, uh, Mr. Speaker, in making sure that suppression uh, activities through the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry were going on, Mr. Speaker, that the community uh, continued to have a smooth and steady evacuation. You know, there's an hour of um, maintenance required every time one of those Hercules landed on, on the strip, Mr. Speaker. So this was just an incredible uh, exercise in a short period of time. We remain committed Response. to the threat, Mr. Speaker, that while the fire is suppressed, smoke could turn back on the community and we'll be ready to evacuate any other people that the, ch the, the chief uh, sees. Fit, Great Mr. Job. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Prime Minister. If, for the Premier, rather. Lesman. More unnecessary cuts to frontline health care resources by abruptly cutting funding for a program to help youth quit smoking. Leave the pack behind, as it is called, is a very successful, evidence based smoking cessation program for youth. It is a $1 million a year investment that page pays huge dividend. Speaker, tobacco kills 50% of their user. One in two smokers died of their addiction. This health promotion program supports our health care system. It supports young Ontarians by helping them quit smoking and develop healthier habits. Why is the Premier cutting such an important program. The question to the Premier. Minister of Health. Or to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. It is very important to help youth and, and other people who wish to uh, quit smoking to do so. But I think it is important to note that no one pulled funding on this. What actually happened was the previous government had given them a, uh, a one-year program that they decided not to continue with, and we continued with that. Uh, so there's no pulling funding. There's no cutting involved here. This is just something that wasn't renewed. It wasn't renewed under the previous government, and it's continued with us. But it is important to make sure that there are programs that are there to help young people who want to quit smoking. We still have a number of programs out there. The STOP program at KMH, the Ottawa Model for Smoking Cessation at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, and a smoker's helpline that any Ontarian can access regardless of age or location, among many others that I could go into in this supplemental. Thank you. A supplementary question. Speaker, the $1 million to the Leave the Pack program has been in place for 19 years. It is uh, very effective and the funding is not flowing this year. It has flown for the last 19 years. The Canadian Lung Association released a report a few days ago that says that the government is not doing enough to reduce tobacco use. It talks about the troubling rate of young people starting to vape. For the first time in decades, the smoking rates are going up, not down. So what does this government do? Well, it passes legislation that allows tobacco company to directly market vaping products to the public on school campuses or across the streets from high school. Marketing is very effective, Speaker. In my writing, 50% of high school, high school students, none of them over the age of 18, are vaping. Question. Why is the Premier making it easier for tobacco company to sell their vaping and smoking products to young people in Ontario? Questions been referred to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. 
Well, once again, it's important to note that the original program the member referred to was uh, started to be wound down in 2017, and that has continued. But again, it's important to, to realize, recognize that there are many other programs that are out there to help young people and anyone who wishes to stop smoking. In addition to the ones that I've already mentioned to you, there are the uh, public health unit stop on the road, the smokers helpline I referred to, Lakehead University moving on to be being free, uh, Cancer Care Ontario, Aboriginal Tobacco Program, Aboriginal Health Access Centres, Healthy Eating, Active Living, Ontario Federation of Indigenous Friendship Centres, Urban Aboriginal Healthy Living Program, uh, as well as the work that's being uh, done at CAMH. So there are a number of programs out there. They are available for people across Ontario that wish to stop smoking. Uh, and so Response. we urge anybody who is interested to be in contact with one of those programs for that assistance. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Our government is committed to putting the people at the centre of every decision we make, and we are protecting what matters most. In my riding and across Ontario, health and safety matters. The minister has spent hours on the road announcing great projects across rural Ontario, and he's seen firsthand the critical road and bridge infrastructure that our communities needed most. While Ontario launches the most ambitious infrastructure program in history, Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is saying the province is not at the table, and I'm baffled by this criticism. Would the minister please tell us about what our government is doing for rural Ontario? Questions to the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that excellent and very important question. Uh, I echo the member's concern for crucial health and safety project, uh, projects across rural and northern Ontario. Trudeau's comments are simply baffling, Mr. Speaker. To say we are stalling on our infrastructure commitments is dead wrong. As the Auditor General, Senate and Parliamentary Budget Officer have all said, the federal record on the infrastructure file is poor. In fact, Mr. Speaker, billions of dollars uh, went missing under Justin Trudeau's watch. Mr. Speaker, we have our priorities straight in Ontario. While the federal Liberals are focused on the election season, I'm focused on the construction season. Thus far, Mr. Speaker, thus far, we've nominated 49 rural and northern road and bridge projects to Ottawa. And you know what, Mr. Speaker, not a single one has been approved by Justin Trudeau. In Kitchener-Conestoga, this includes Spons? the Glasgow Street South Bridge in the township of Woolwich. Mr. Speaker, our government was at work on Sunday to put the people first. I'm calling on Justin Trudeau to reflect this commitment and approve these projects. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that excellent answer. When it comes to vital infrastructure investments, it's important that we get it right. And as a caucus, we're encouraged by the constant flow of great announcements from the Minister of Infrastructure. For my riding, the most important has been crucial transit infrastructure that allows my constituents to travel safely. Speaker, our government was elected on a mandate to open Ontario for business and to get this province moving. Despite having nominated five GTA transit projects that my constituents desperately need, the federal government chooses to pick a fight instead of picking up a shovel. Okay. Would the Minister of Infrastructure tell us more about how we're putting this province back on track and helping municipalities get moving? Minister. Well, thank you uh, very much to the uh, member for that great question. Mr. Speaker, for months we've heard the federal government ask us to send them projects for approval. They even said that Ontario's priorities were their priorities. On May 15th, we nominated our 54th project to the federal government. The ball is clearly now in their court. And these are important projects, Mr. Speaker. We have now nominated five GTA transit projects, which will require a combined 
$28.5 billion, of which we are committing $11.2 billion. This is funding for five new transit infrastructure projects in the GTA, including the Ontario Line, the Young North Extension, the Bloor Young Enhancement Project, Three Stop Scarborough Subway Extension, and the Smart Track Station Program. The Liberals are desperately trying to change the channel from their scandal plagued government in Ottawa. Mr. Speaker, my message to Justin Trudeau is clear. Put your money where your mouth is. And Mr. Response. Speaker, we want Justin Trudeau to join us in getting Ontario moving. Order. Order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, families watching the Raptors this week on TV had a lot to cheer for, but when the commercial breaks came, they also had a, a lot to uh, jeer basically seeing that their money was wasted on governments, uh, the government's latest, latest partisan ad campaign. Speaker, can the Premier tell us how much the taxpayers of Ontario are paying for the primetime advertising spot? The question is to the Premier. Order. The Minister of Energy. The Deputy Premier referred to the Minister of Energy. One thing that we know, the taxpayers are paid somewhere north of $3.5 million for the federal government to send postcards to everybody, that they'd be getting $307 uh, net benefit, Mr. Speaker, Order. for this job-killing regressive carbon tax. Now, isn't that something, Mr. Speaker? We heard from Air Canada that they have not even begun Order. to see how much of an impact this tax is going to have on the price per ticket, Mr. Speaker. We know that we were at a meeting last week uh, down in Chatham, Mr. Speaker, a great MPP down there standing up for folks and in our industrial uh, conservation initiative consultations on the price of electricity. All the talk was about job-killing carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, why it's contributing, for example, to the highest cost Response. per kilogram of chicken for chicken farmers, Mr. Speaker. We won't, we won't stand for that, Mr. Speaker. The people of Ontario deserve to know how much this tax is costing them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The opposition has to come to order. Supplementary question. The minister seemed to forget the money that pays for these ads are not their money, Speaker. It belongs to the people of the province. Speaker, the same Premier who says that there's no money to keep teachers in the classroom, to help children with autism, or to end hallway medicine, finds plenty of cash when it's time to get his partisan campaign air, uh, ads on the air, Speaker. How can the Premier tell children with autism to wait for treatment or tell seniors that, have the, that are in the hallway that that's good enough for them, Speaker, while he's author authorizing multi-million dollar ad buys for his own partisan purposes? Minister of Energy again. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last, uh, last week, we had an opportunity to identify just exactly how much this tax was going to be costing health care in Essex, Mr. Order. Speaker. Let's take a look at Windsor West ground effects. They make automotive products here, Mr. Speaker. And the estimated add-on by suppliers, Mr. Speaker, in 2019 as a result of this job-killing carbon tax is $1.5 million in 2019, aggregate to $3.9 million in 2019. 2022, Mr. Speaker. Add on the $3.5 million that the federal government has, sent, has spent to send their postcards around. I suspect the people in Essex are getting a little bit anxious about how much this tax is really going to cost them. That's why, Mr. Speaker, this question is sticking around. Opposition We're going to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that at those pumps there's a sticker to remind Response. the people of Essex and across the province of Ontario how much this job-killing regressive carbon tax is costing them, their families, our businesses and our employers, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Our government is committed to making Ontario open for business and open for jobs. Across northern Ontario, thousands of Ontarians and their families depend on the forestry sector to put food on the table. The forestry sector harvests a truly renewable resource. Workers in this sector 
are excellent stewards of our natural resources, planting an average of 68 million trees every year through reforestation efforts. Last week, the minister was in Timmins and Hearst, meeting directly with industry and other stakeholders. Can the minister please update the House on what he is hearing from stakeholders as we rebuild the forestry sector in Ontario? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the uh, great member from Sault Ste. Marie for the question. We had a great trip to Hearst and Timmins last week, and it's encouraging to see the great work being done as the sector continues to innovate. Last Thursday, I had the opportunity to tour Columbia Forest Products plywood mill in Hearst, where our government's investment of $3.2 million over the next five years will help create and retain nearly 350 well-paying jobs in that community. Later in the day, I took part in our final forestry roundtable with stakeholders from the broad, broader forestry sector. This was the final one as we developed a new provincial forestry strategy, and I look forward to speaking more about the feedback we received from stakeholders in the supplementary. We are behind forestry in the Ford government. Yeah. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that excellent answer. I know that he has been working very hard on the development of a new provincial forestry strategy, having held roundtables all across the province. After 15 years of the previous Liberal government favouring special interest groups and neglecting the hard-working Ontarians who make their livings in the forestry sector, it is encouraging to see that the sector is confident in our government's plan to make Ontario open for business and open for jobs. Now that the forestry roundtables have been completed, can the minister please update the House on what he has heard from the sector through the process of developing a new provincial forestry strategy? Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank the member for the supplementary as well. And we did hear, we have heard from the forestry sector of how the previous government viewed their sector as a sunset industry that was on its way out. We believe the best days for forestry are ahead. We've heard from the crucial needs for forestry access roads, which I was pleased to announce earlier this year that we were continuing funding of $54 million a year for that program. The biggest challenge facing this industry is access to wood. Access to wood and access to wood, the three biggest problems. And our new forestry strategy as we develop is going to address that so that the forestry of tomorrow will be a forest industry that people's children will be able to get good jobs in because we are not ignoring it. It is a great industry and his best days are ahead of it if the government is doing the right thing. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Uh, the cuts to Legal Aid Ontario will prevent the most vulnerable Ontarians from accessing justice here in our province. These cuts hit communities that struggle the most. Individuals, our province, should actually be helping, Mr. Speaker. For example, the South Asian Legal Clinic of Ontario, who serves clients across the province and including in my city of Brampton, uh, worked on behalf of a client named Sapia, a tenant who has had significant mental health and physical health disabilities. Her landlord was actually trying to evict her from her unit. With legal support, Safia, uh, without legal support, she would have been evicted, leading to homelessness, Mr. Speaker. But because of the support through the legal aid clinic, um, Safia was able to stay in her unit, and the landlord tenant and tenant board ruled in her favour, uh, and they've actually modified her unit since then to accommodate for her disability. Speaker, why is the Premier making it impossible for Ontarians like Safia to receive the legal aid? Aid they need. The Deputy Premier. To the Attorney General. Referred to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, over the last five years, over the last five years, Mr. Speaker, we saw the prior government spending more and more money without seeing the results that the people who need the services and the Ontario taxpayer, taxpayers should expect. We have to make sure that legal aid is focused on providing the legal representation to, the, to get legal advice to those people who need it, when they need it, and where they need it. Legal aid this year will have a budget of over $400 million, Mr. Speaker, and even more if the federal government uh, pays its fair share for the services that it's responsible for. But I have been very clear, Mr. Speaker, 
The legal aid has also stated very clearly that frontline services will continue to remain strong. So people like Savia will be able to go to the South Asian Legal Clinic and get the services she needs. Response. Mr. Speaker, lawyers may not welcome this era of new uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of accountability at legal aid, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Um, the Premier has repeatedly promised that no job losses will happen to frontline services, but that simply is not true, despite even what the Attorney General is saying here in this House today. This province's legal aid lawyers, legal workers and support staff now find their, their jobs actually on the chopping block, Mr. Speaker. Low-income Ontarians receive legal aid because of the work that these individuals do for the most vulnerable people here in our province. Community legal aid clinics already operate slim budgets, and they are running their their operations as effectively and efficiently as they possibly can. Even minor budget cuts will mean job losses and reduction of frontline services again, Mr. Speaker, to the most vulnerable people here in our province. Will the Premier reverse these cuts, cruel and devastating cuts, to legal aid before it's too late? And he's telling us no, so we'll make sure we get that on the record. No, the Premier will not reverse the cuts. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I have been very clear. Those people in Ontario who need and cannot afford legal representation will be able to continue to go to legal aid and get those frontline services. Here, here. Our government is committed to ensuring that Order. those legal services are there for those who need it when and where. The Ministry of the Attorney General is working very closely with legal aid itself, with clinics, with stakeholders across the justice sector to make sure that legal aid is providing those, that legal representation in the most efficient way possible. Hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent on legal aid. Ontario taxpayers now know that it's being done in an efficient way while we are still ensuring that those who need legal representation will be able to get it. Mr. Speaker, legal aid is Order. doing great work to ensure that the, rep the clinics and the representation that people are seeking is available and they will continue to do so. Mr. Speaker, the NDP should stop letting pe telling people that they will not be able to get those services because they will continue to be able to go to legal aid and get the legal representation. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Last week, the Minister announced at the Open Government Summit in Ottawa the results of our government's public consultation are on our data strategy. Mr. Speaker, I've heard from many Ontarians about the importance of protecting their personal data as, well as we live in a world that is increasingly driven by the use of data. More than ever before, data is used not only by businesses but also by governments to ensure the public is receiving the services they need in a timely fashion. Recognizing this, it is of paramount importance that our government develops a provincial data strategy that protects Ontarians' privacy. I know that our government has been listening to Ontarians on this issue. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please outline the key findings of our government's public consultation? Thank you. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, Speaker. And through you, I want to thank my honourable colleague for his question and the great representation on behalf of the people of Mississauga East Cooksville. Our government recognizes the tremendous economic prevent potential of emerging data technologies needs to be balanced with thoughtful and robust protections for the privacy and personal data of all Ontarians. We believe that Ontarians deserve to know and consent to how their data is collected and used and by whom. Mr. Speaker, through public consultations on our government data strategy, we heard that 79 percent of respondents believe data about people and businesses in Ontario needs stronger protection. We heard that a majority of respondents indicated they would like the government to responsibly share more of its own data with businesses to help them create new jobs, products and services for Ontarians. And we heard a majority of respondents also believe sharing data among ministries will help streamline and improve interaction between citizens and government. Mr. Speaker, these results make it clear that while citizens understand the benefits of sharing data, our provincial data strategy Spons? must ensure personal privacy protection is paramount. And we are committed to do just that to the best of our ability. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the minister for his response. I'm very pleased to hear that our government is taking a proactive approach to protecting Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, the federal government has recently released their, their digital charter. 
It is disappointing that the federal government has taken their entire four-year mandate to take action on this important issue, one that took our government only 10 months to address. One example that shows Canadians need clear rights and protection is smart cities. Smart cities are not new. In fact, they are being developed across Ontario. But these smart cities are moving forward without a policy framework. Last fall, the Auditor General reminded our government that a policy framework is needed to guide future developments of smart cities in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, could the minister outline our government's smart city framework and how we will balance the needs of business and governments while protecting Ontarians' data? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. My colleague from Mississauga East Cooksville raises a very important point. Smart cities are not new. In fact, they're being developed across Ontario, including right here in Toronto. That is why we're developing a framework that will require smart cities and the companies that create them to guarantee that Ontario's privacy and personal data are protected, managed responsibly, and kept secure. Put people first by ensuring that Ontarians are the primary beneficiaries and valued partners in the opportunities created by the project. Create responsible and good governance systems that are democratic, accountable, and transparent. Enact leading best technical practices that ensure chosen technologies use open software and open standards and are secure, interoperable, locally procured, flexible, durable, and scalable. And educate the public on the risks associated with the project and provide meaningful opportunities for local residents to participate and engage in the creation of the smart city. Mr. Speaker, this will ensure our province is open for business Response. and protecting Ontarians. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week, the government put cuts to municipalities on the back burner. But as we speak, retroactive cuts to conservation authorities are still going ahead. The ravages of climate crisis is evident all around us, and conservation authorities are trying to respond to record flooding in our watersheds with less resources than they had before. These cuts put communities <coughs> at risk. When will this government reverse cuts to the Natural Hazard Management Grant Project, protect communities, and increase funding for all the vital work that conservation authorities do? Questions to the Premier. Uh, through, through you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for her, her uh, question. Well, I guess the, when they were lounging around the pool on the weekend, my Minister of Natural Resources was actually out, out working, working his back off with conservation for authority her. officers. So my minister decided to give me a call on, I believe it was Saturday, minister, and, and put me on the phone with two conservation officers. Order. Can you hold my time for a minute? So, Mr. Speaker, he called me up. I answered the phone like I try to, no matter whose calls, pick, pick it up, and it was the minister on the phone. He passed the phone to the two conservation officers. I spoke to each one individually. They are as happy as punch with this government. They thank me profusely yeah. over and over again for doing the great work. We're going to be getting more conservation officers. And I'll tell you, they, they absolutely love this government. I love those conservation officers. They do a great job. They're out there working hard. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we couldn't even open our marriage. Well, uh, thank you. This is to the Premier as well. Conservation officers are not the same as conservation authorities. And, uh, the conservation authorities have had their funding cut. I don't know if you know the difference. Another program that's been cut is the Summer Employment Opportunities Youth Employment Program. Its funding has been cut by the Ministry of Natural Resources. This program helps conservation authorities employ and mentor youth, and young people gain relevant experience for their careers. Why did this government cut the Youth Employment Program? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Natural Resources. And it's referred to the Minister of Natural Resources. Well, I, I thank the Premier for taking that call from my conservation officers the other day. I said to the member, thank you for the question, but we have spoken about this before. We have asked conservation authorities to focus on their core mandate, yeah. not, the con not the 
these creep, the mission creep that they have brought upon themselves over the last number of decades. We've said, focus on why you were brought into this province in the first place. The province's funding averages about 8 per cent to conservation authorities of their actual of their total funding. In some cases, it's less than 2.5 per cent. But let's talk about what's been going on in some of them. As the Auditor General pointed out, there was one conservation authority that their administrative spending went up by 48 per cent, while watershed services was down by 18 per cent. That's why we're saying to conservation authorities, get back to what the purpose was in the initial why you were initiated in the first place concentrate on your core mandate and look for some savings thank you thank you <laughs> it concludes the time for question period this morning pursuant to standing order 38a the member for Davenport has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Education concerning the loss of teacher jobs. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has informed me that he has a point of order. Uh, thanks, Speaker. Um, I want to introduce to you and through you to members of the Legislative Assembly uh, representatives from my girls' government from the riding, along with representatives from Girls Inc. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. The member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. I wasn't able to do some introductions early, uh, so beg your indulgence. Um, some autism parents and advocates are with us once again today. Angela Brandt, Amy Maldeski, and her son Jacob, and Stacey Kennedy. I'd also like to give a warm welcome to uh, some friends who have joined us from Simcoe North today. I know one of my colleagues has introduced them already, but uh, like I said, they're friends. Elizabeth Van Hout, Dennis Ruzzo, and Zoe Rizzo are the family of Ariana, our Paige uh, Rizzo, and they're joined by their friend uh, Riley Marek. Welcome to Queen's Park. The member for Don Valley North on a point of order. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My guests just come to the house. Welcome to Queen's Park. There being no deferred votes, this house stands in recess until 1 p.m. <laughs>